I really like meeting the patients. This is one of my favourite things at this meeting. Sit down at breakfast, you can talk to the patients and really find out more about the illness. So I'm going to tell you about some work we've been doing uh, on metabolomics. We've looked at two cohorts, one from the UK Biobank and a Polish cohort. And I'm also, it's quite dry, this data. So there's some posters around, so the detail is on the posters. I'll give you a flavour for, for what we found. But I want to, at the end of the talk, talk a bit about some work I've become aware of recently around l form bacteria, what we're finding in patients. Not just in ME patients, but in other chronic illnesses. So I'll just give you a, a flavor for that. Um, so this was talked about yesterday in the workshops and at the meeting. So I think there's definitely been movements in ME CFS research over the last two years we've been involved. There is some validation, but there is a lot of areas where we can't replicate. And there is more funding coming in. But there isn't really a clear focus, and as Chris pointed out yesterday, there aren't very many things we know. Um, and also the infrastructure is important to do this work um, going forward. And how do we do, how do we have the infrastructure that allows us to replicate studies across different labs? So I'll talk about the, um, the two cohorts, and also this new area, which I think is really exciting, and one that I think we definitely need to think about working on throughout the world. Um, we're very grateful for the ME Association. Um, they funded this work, and also Charles threw us a lifeline last year. We, we had no money. Um, we've got money until the end of this year, but after that, we need to work out what we're going to do next. So thank you to the ME Association. They've been great. So just to give you an idea of what we've got, so we work with two cohorts, one from our collaborator in Poland, Pau Zawinski. They've got hardly any money. I don't know how they do this. Um, in Poland, ME is not a disease that's recognized at all, um, but somehow they've managed to recruit and diagnose patients in a really clever way. The other cohort is from the UK Biobank, and you're going to hear more about that from Jackie after, after my talk. So both, both um, sites diagnose patients, process samples, and we have a budget, quite a small budget, of about 70 to 80k to do this work over the last few years. There's a lot of people involved, many are students, we don't have real experts and that really holds us back, but Jamie and Tiff have learned so much about how to analyse these enormously complicated data sets. So James McCulloch is the Professor of Chemistry, we do the work in his lab, we had two placement students working on the methodologies over the years. Uh, my group, so Jamie and Tiffany, and they work part-time on this, this data. And Megan also, she got involved in most things in my group, so she also got involved in this and also she'll talk about her antiviral stuff later on. And then you go through a process of running the samples, processing the samples, you run them through the machine, and then the big bit is this, the data analysis, working out what you've got with all the variables that you pull out. Um, I think this is an interesting slide. Um, we heard about GWAS and there's various omic technologies, but this is a big question that I've got now, is how omics is metabolomics in terms of what we're looking at? Um, is it just a subset of what we have there? And should we really call it an omics? And I'll talk about that as we go along. So this is a cell, and what we're doing, or trying to do, is to use plasma as a way of looking at what the body's doing. So, you know, a cell will have various pathways. I, I don't expect you to read this, not, not on these slide screens anyway, um, but there's metabolism here. This bit is the glycolysis, mitochondria, um, and everything feeds off that, essentially. And you, and you make products, and these products are in the cell, and they come out the cell. So what we're trying to see, whether we can get a handle on what the cells or tissues are doing in a patient by measuring these in blood in plasma. But you've also got other things going on. So as well as the metabolic, metabolic pathways, you could have the influence of a virus, quite topical at the moment, fungi, bacteria, um, drugs. Many of us take medications. Also toxic chemicals have been raised. All these things could influence what your outcomes are at the end. So this is quite a simple slide. So there's the big organs that are heavily involved, the brain, the liver, muscle, uh, and the bowel. But also the microbiome is also involved in what we find in blood. Um, we need to bear that in mind. So, you're a patient, this is just a sort of schematic really. You go to the doctor for many, many times, you finally get diagnosed, but they do a few tests. None of these tests show anything. They're all pretty inconclusive. There's nothing really wrong with you. So what we're doing is looking at this part. So we're looking at everything else in the blood to see whether we can find markers that are ME specific. That's what we're after. Are there things in the blood that are, are relevant to this illness? So these are shown in yellow. And we have knowns, things we can identify. We have things that we putatively can identify, but the bulk of what we're finding at the moment are unknowns. We don't know what they are yet. Um, all we're really trying to work out is are they different? Are there any patterns in the data? And there's also noise and breakdown products then, and we've got to try and work through all of this to work out what's going on. 
So this is a simple scenario. You've got your, your, your whole person. Different organs would feed into that. And what you hope to find is the, the, the ME CFS. But that's not the real story. And we heard about this yesterday. There's all these confounding factors that can influence what's going on. So you could have some anxiety, depression, lack of sleep. You, know, you name it, medication. Is it a male or a female? How old they are? They can all potentially influence these metabolites. Some might go down and some might go up we can try and adjust for things like BMI and age, but it's impossible to know how depressed a person is. It's not very easy, these things. And also the control group will have these same things going on as well. It's not just the patients. Um, so you've probably got something more like this. You've got your ME factors, but there's a whole lot of noise in there as well and things that are consistent across the group. And you may, your ME factors may be modulated, so they could go brown. Here's a brown one. It's an ME factor, but it's changed by what the patient is doing or what they're, what they're experiencing. So the two cohorts are, are really quite interesting, and I think, is, is Heidi still here or is she gone? Oh, she's here. So I think this might help with your Australian study. So the, the Polish cohort and the UK Biobank cohort, um, they're quite different. This one is quite big for an ME cohort, but it's on the small size for many things. So 54 mild to moderate patients, a smaller group of controls, um, a much bigger cohort from the Biobank. Um, we've got over 150 patients. They're mainly moderates and severes, not many milds. Um, 50 healthy controls, and this is a crucial group. The multiple sclerosis group is another fatigue group that we looked at. Uh, and, and that hasn't been done before. Most people have just done this comparison in all the data that's come out so far. Um, this one's quite straightforward to do, so they were diagnosed with the Canadian criteria um, by, by Carolyn Kingdom, who goes out and meets the patients, uh, takes the blood. The Polish one was more complicated, so there's no, nobody knows that they've got ME in Poland. So they did a pre-screen, uh, 1,500 people phoned up and were interested in the study. They did a Fucada assessment initially. They then came in and had a full clinical assessment. So they, they were asked about PEM, they had a psychiatrist, psychiatrist a neurologist, internal medicine, a CPAP test, three or four hours of, of real clinical assessment. And then people were excluded from the study. So the depressed patients weren't included, the neurology ones, anyone was underlying. So we've got quite a defined cohort on this side, whereas here you've got um, diagnosed by the criteria, but you're going to have a more heterogeneous population. Um, the other difference is these were taken in the clinic. Um, these were taken at various sites, collection sites. Um, these were processed really fast, so 45 minutes to an hour, quite quickly. These were very variable, so 45 minutes from somebody in the clinic, but up to 14 hours. So there's huge differences in, in processing time. So what difference does that make to the data? Um, the, the age was a bit different, so these were younger, sort of 10 years younger on average, and these were older, but there was quite a spread around the sort of mean of 10 years. So this is what we had to work with. Um, we started off on the Polish cohort, and that's what we've, we've probably got to the, almost the paper stage of that. I think, Jamie, will you agree with that? So um, we're, we're trying to write this up at the moment. Um, but the biobank data, we're a long way away from the full analysis. So we use the mass spec, and essentially we have four methods that are designed to enrich for things like amino acids, um, either certain types of lipids, two types, or the TCA cycle intermediates. And we pick up a huge number of signatures in the sort of, if you add them all together, it's about 30 odd, 30,000. Some of them are duplicated. Um, very few unknowns, very few knowns in our code. We don't have enough um, compounds that we know exactly what they are, only 167. Um, we can, some of them, this is growing, the list of putative ID compounds, 202. But the bulk of things that we find, we don't know what they are at the moment. Um, if you look at metabolon, they're, they're, the people use them a lot to do this type of work. They have a, a general panel of 768 compounds, and the lip, lipid panel is 1,000, so about 2,000 compounds. So my question is, what are we not seeing when we send samples to metabolon? Are there things that are relevant that we need to know about? Um, so what we're trying to do with this type of approach, so could it be used as a diagnostic? Could we use metabolomics to diagnose patients? Um, but probably more, more relevant would be, are there therapeutic targets we could find that come out of these pathways. So there are two sort of goals, really, of the work. Um, this is from the Polish cohort. It's quite a busy slide. Essentially, we're trying to see whether there's any statistical difference between all the metabolites between the two groups. So the green ones are the patients, and the red ones are the controls. And you can see they separate really quite nicely. When we do sort of statistics analysis, so a Q2 value tells you whether there is a, a model there, are there differences in the model, and a value of above 0.3 is highly relevant. So this is 0.78, that's a very good model. So we can distinguish, distinguish very well with this cohort 
between the two groups. We have over 3,000 things that are significantly significant, and then we can look at those. But that's a huge number of things to look at. It's a really robust model, um, but it's the model with the exclusions. So this is the quite tight model to look at. This is just from the amino acid method. This is the one we've done most of the work on. The biobank cohort is very different. Um, so individually, these groups are similar. So the healthy control will be the mild. That's a bit like our Polish cohort. Um, there's about 50 of each in here. It, it doesn't model at all. You, know, you can see they're all mixed up. Um, across the board, um, poor Q statistics. So really, it doesn't look like there's any real difference between the groups um, on this type of modeling, looking at you know, are there factors that can distinguish. Um, so what does this mean, really, for the two cohorts is a, is a big question we had. Um, so th this is the first slide from the Polish cohort. This is our top statistically ranked compounds that show a difference. Um, and essentially, they're really significant. Some have got very big fold changes, but we don't know what they are. They're all unknowns. All top 15 are unknown. So are they real? Um, they model the two cohorts very well. All their noise and fragments. I, would, I think they are real, but we need to work out what they are. And that was the next stage. So this is a couple of examples. And there's some really quite interesting ones here. Um, the, the Norwegian groups have done a lot of work on amino acids. They generally are lower in the patients. So glutamine's low, uh, cysteine's low, and asparagine's low. This one's a bit variable. So glutamic acid can be very high or very low in patients. And this one is a bit different. This one is really interesting. So two amino quinolone, it is quite different um, between the groups. Um, so that's the knowns. And then as we go through, these are the ones with putative IDs. These on this slide are the lipid compounds. So very similar to Bob Navio's work, we're finding a drop in some of the lipids. But again, we need to do more work to identify them. But there's a range here. They're not that heterogeneous. So here you can see there's a, quite a difference between the groups in the concentrations. Some unknowns. They are very heterogeneous in groups. This banjo plot's quite nice. So you can see in the ME cohorts in the light blue, there's clusters of patients. There could be subgroups of patients with some of these compounds. Um, so these are the two models, just to go back and to show you. So the Polish cohort with, it, with, the, with exclusions is quite different, whereas the, something with the Canadian criteria, you get a very mixed bag. And even the control groups are quite broad here. Um, and we wonder whether this could be the age of the patients. There's, you know, as we get older, we have niggles and things that aren't quite working right. So maybe there's a difference with age, but, but we don't really know. Um, so coming back to the, the biobank, it's a, it gives us a poor model, but is there anything useful that comes out of the model? So we've got this type of scenario with lots of sort of variability in there. Can we, can we tease out any ME factors? And so Tiffany's looked at this in quite a lot of detail, and there's a poster on that side if you want to see more. So start with B. So these are mild to moderate patients in the Polish cohort. And essentially, we're finding, finding duplication. So glutamic acid is elevated in the mild to moderates, and so is taurine. But as you get more severe, it, it, it's not there so much. So there is a difference across the cohort. Um, but there is some um, validation in between the two studies in this group. These are probably more interesting. So kynurin is an interesting compound that the um, Ron Davies group are interested in. Around, and there is a big difference in the severes with kynurin in the plasma, not so much in the other group. Tyrosine, again, severes. And the MS cohort is proving really valuable. So this is another fatigue group. And here you can see it's more like the controls. These two are particularly interesting. And I've got them on the next slide. And also, this shows you the variation between the groups. And, and so if you look at these two, these are two particularly very interesting unknown compounds. Healthy controls, mild, moderates, severes, MS. And you can see there's a real drop as you get more severe with this compound. But it's not found in the MS patients at all. And the same here. The MS patients are more like the control group. So this is quite nice. This makes me think that this could be an ME-specific factor. But we just need to work out what it is. Um, and again, that's the same. A bit, bit of a bigger slide, because I knew the screens are terrible. So um, you can see that on that slide. Um, so our aim at the moment is to see whether we can subgroup patients based on the metabolites and also the clinical variables. We've got a fantastic clinical variable set for the Polish cohort. Um, and we also got exercise patients. Uh, it's not a good thing to do to patients, but we have the data. And, and we know um, how, they, how the outcomes work in the patients. So this is one of Jamie's heat maps. It's really quite interesting. So 
up this side just to explain, we've got the top 60 compounds that discriminate the Polish patients, the controls and the pa uh, from, the, from the patients, um, the healthy controls here. And basically what we're seeing is if it's, if it's reddish, it means it's higher on average um, than the average values across uh, a rank. So this compound here. So this compound here is, is very high in the controls and it's blue means it's lower in the, in the patients. Um, and so that you can see there's a real difference here between the groups. Uh, but there are, are people in the patients that look very similar to the controls. So you can see these outlined here. They're more like the, the control profile. So I think being able to subgroup the patients is going to be really valuable and important as we, as we go forwards. So what we're doing at the moment, um, can we identify these unknown compounds? Some of them look really interesting to follow up on. And can we start to separate groups based on the different parameters? And we've, we're getting some success with this. And if we come back next year, we can tell you a bit more about that. And we also have some patients, um, so the polls um, have developed a cognitive test. They published that. It, it didn't go down very well with lots of people. However, we have the data and we can look at them and see. So if somebody did have a cognitive change with exercise, what, does their, what do their metabolites show? And we can look at that and we plan to look at that. So that's all I've really got to say around the metabolomics. And for the next bit, I want to talk about the L forms because I think they're absolutely fascinating. So there's lots of chronic diseases where we have got no idea what the causes are. There's a list of them on this slide. Um, we know what the cause of this one is, but we don't really know why it reoccurs. Endometriosis, fibromyalgia, migraine, joint problems. These two, we really don't know what drives um, the, the bulk of the symptoms. So this is my hypothesis. So could these chronic diseases be linked to abnormalities in the blood and tissue biome? With some of the symptoms maybe linked to where, what what the organisms are and where they're located. Are they in the brain? Are they in the, in the joints? Where, whereabouts are they? And so I'm, I'm very lucky. I've got two collaborators. We don't actually have any sort of big research. Well, I've talked to Julian Kenyon from the Dove Clinic for about six years. He's quite a, sh a shrewd guy. And Brent Hunt founded Soft Cell Biologicals in 2015. He suffers from fibromyalgia. He's got ME. He has real chronic joint pr problems. And he was a microbiologist. And so what the way these two come together is the microbiome. And this slide's always made me sit up. I've, been, I've seen lots of data on it. This is from Esther Crawley's group in Bristol. And this is the ALSPAC cohort, where they looked at the number of consultations per year um, before diagnosis. So the adult group in this paper were going to the doctors 15 years before they actually were diagnosed. I know it takes a long time to get diagnosed. Um, so there was something going on a long, long time before diagnosis. And I always wonder, what could that be? What could be building up over time in these, in these individuals? Um, so we helped Julian on a couple of studies. So Julian runs a private clinic. And he, did, he came to me and said, well, I've got this really interesting microbiome data. He used the, uh, the, the King's group, Map My Gut. He sent his patients um, stool samples there. So we've got cancer, ME, um, small cohort obesity. And what was really interesting was that all the clinical conditions showed a very narrow diversity of the biome. The control group um, had a much wider diversity. And these, these were actually patients that had improved. If you, if you look in the actual cohort um, from, the, from the King's group, the controls also have this quite broad biome. He then went on and, and, and did um, fecal transplants in patients, published a small study, 42 chronic fatigue patients. I don't know how he does this. Uh, 30 had irritable bowel syndrome. Half of them had a, like a um, pre probiotic, prebiotic, uh, and the others were given a fecal transplant. The outcome measures were terrible. There wasn't really any outcome measures in the paper at all. It was based on what, how he felt as a clinician. So again, that didn't go down very well either. And so I thought, well, these two should get together. Uh, and, and there's also this is new data coming out around um, tissue. So it doesn't look like we are sterile. It doesn't look like blood is sterile. There are things in our blood that have been there probably for thousands of years, and we've always had them. And we're just now starting to, to be aware of, of, of what they are. And there may be a normal biome in our blood that we have to have. So moving on to soft cell, and they are quite a remarkable company in the US. So 2015, they've worked out a way of culturing microorganisms from blood that you can't normally, you can't just put them on an agar plate, they won't grow. And it's always been a challenge to grow anything from a blood sample. So they've looked at over 2,000 blood samples. They can culture um, L type fungi and L type bacteria. Essentially what an L form is, it's either a fungal um, species or a bacteria without a wall. So there's no cell wall. Um, they're not very immunogenic and they 
seem to be found in, in blood and in tissues. Um, they have an interesting property of blebbing, so vesicle, vesicles are shed from these things at huge numbers. So there's not much known about patients, but a lot of literature around L forms in nature, and they are well known to just shed consistently loads of membrane fragments into media. You can see that here. I've got some slides to show that. He's also sequenced them by whole genome sequencing, and he's finding over 5,000 um, of these L form bacteria in the patients. 300 new bacteria that have never been found before, which is quite remarkable. And what's really interesting is that over 100 of these L form bacteria, once you've got them in culture, if you grow them on a plate, which you can do, they will be pathogenic. So a lot of these L forms are actually known pathogens, um, but at the moment we don't know they're there. So this is a, an example of an L form bacteria from a, from a patient in culture. Uh, you can't see it very well, there's lots of little vesicles coming off. And so this is like a, a mother cell. They can be quite big in size, but the vesicles are the same size as exosomes. There's a whole spectrum of, of uh, microvesicles there. Um, this is fascinating. So this is a white blood cell from, I don't think it's from an ME patient, but you can see the little green spots here. These are L forms in a cell in a, a time-lapse video, and the cell is not doing anything. It's sat there, but what are these things doing to the cell? You know, what could a bacteria in a cell without a wall be doing? And they look very much like mitochondria, which is quite interesting. This is a nice paper, came out very recently, and they basically show that you can infect um, mouse macrophages with L-forms. So it's been demonstrated in vitro, and this is one of the first studies I've seen in actually patients, in the cells in patients. So the other thing they do is they grow L-forms from cultures, from the blood from patients. This is ME-CFS patients. This is a healthy sample. Uh, on average, you don't grow, but you do have L-forms, but you don't grow very many from them. Over 200 patient samples, 78 patients. There's a huge number that they are able to culture from ME patients. Ten, ten, on average, 10, some are massively high. But when you add in fibromyalgia, it goes up even more. So these conditions that are comorbid, you may have migraines with ME, you may have all these things. They could all be impacted by these bacteria. If you look at um, immunely compromised individuals, they have a high level, but not high, as high as the ME patients. So over 314 people um, they've been looked at, and these are the average values of these L forms. Unfortunately, as we get older, we have more L forms, not surprising, which is a bit disappointing. We're going to go down. Um, and obviously, when you're younger, you don't have so many. So this is where it gets really interesting. So I said to Julian, you can't publish another paper like this. You've got to do some outcome measures. Well, why don't we work with soft cell? Why don't you send them blood samples before you do the FMT, and let's see what you find. Um, so this is the first patient they've done. Um, they're doing 10, and soft cell are going to do all the sequencing. So this patient developed a viral encephalomyelitis in 2018, ended up with a really severe chronic fatigue syndrome, had seizures, was put on Keppra, um, and he was long that and Julian tried lots of things. He treats his patient, and he tried FMT, and he's doing really well. Um, has had no seizures, um, so that's all well and well. But what's different about the patient? And this is where it gets really interesting. So this is quite a complicated slide. So this is a whole genome sequencing of the blood for bacteria, and the orange bars are pre-transplant. So you're picking up. Um, there's this thing called acinetobacter here. Very high levels um, before transplant. This, this one as well. Um, and then the number of bacterial species was 82 um, pre-transplant, and it drops to 42 post-transplant. And, and you can see post-transplant that the actual profile completely changes. So you go from this orange sort of selection of bugs to the gray ones. These three gray ones here, according to soft cell, are the ones you normally find in controls. These are normally in a control individual. They tend to have high levels of these ones um, and not these other orange ones. This one here is basically, if you find that in a patient in hospital, it's a, a red alert warning that you've got an immune compromised individual. Um, so he's also done some good scoring. So we've, we've, we've got in contact with um, Leonard Jason and the DePaul, and we haven't done a proper analysis yet. I don't know if you know the DePaul scale, so the worse you are, the higher the score on the various questions. So the patient came out pretty bad initially, went down to 46 um, after the transplant, but five months in, they're down at six. So Julian would say this person hasn't got ME anymore. And we've just got um, th this samples now on the sequencing this week. So let's see what they show. Um, and whether this can be sustained long term is another question. But it looks really encouraging. Um, so this is, <laughs> I came across this guy, so this guy called Kevin Foster in Oxford, who's just down the road. I, I didn't know much about him. But he's quite famous. He's got this amazing paper, definitely worth a read. And if the Science for ME guys are watching this, can you look at this and tell me what it means? Because it's quite complicated. Um, 
So this is a bacteria um, with a, something called colicin. So it's like the bacterial weapon that it used to kill other bacteria it doesn't like, other strains. It's competing with the environment. So they've tagged it with GFP. And so this one here, uh, when, when the video goes up back again, it, it's green. And essentially, that bacteria will get activated, go green. When it centers another bacteria nearby, it sets off other bacteria next to it. So this is the same strain. This one goes green. When it goes red, it means it's dying and it's shedding. Uh, the, the PI is getting into the cell. But what's interesting about these um, colicins, and I only found this out on Monday, so they can depolarize plasma membranes, and that's how they work. Um, they have DNA's activity, and this is really interesting. So I didn't know what murine synthesis was. It's cell wall production. So you could be driving bacteria into the L form state. And also, this could be impacting on, if you've got these bugs in your cells, um, they could be impacting on your mitochondria in a cell or anything in that cell. And this is almost my final slide. Um, I hope it works, because it's, so two strains of E. coli, um, E2 and E8 strain, and what the, this one has a receptor that triggers that weapon to be turned on, and you know, it should come on now. Uh, and so, and basically, this is the plate of the E2 strain, this is the plate of the E8 strain, and so what you can see, that the, the ones near the receptor start to trigger a reaction, and that goes right across, across the plate. And if you read Kevin's paper, Bacteria are working like ants, you know, ants in their colonies. It's fascinating. You think these really stupid things aren't really stupid at all. They, they have a real way of uh, an awareness of what's around them. So you get this trigger of what's going on across the cell. So this is a toxin made by a bacteria against a bacteria. But what does that bacteria toxin do to us? Could that do something to us uh, in, say, ME, CFS? Uh, and if we have these L forms in our body, what do we do to try and keep them down? If they've been there for thousands of years, which is a possibility, and we get the wrong ones, how do we regulate them? And if they're like mitochondria, maybe there's a link with what we're doing to mitochondria in these individuals. So this is my final slide. Um, we're very poor. We'd like to carry on working in this space. I've just managed to persuade the University of Oxford to set me up a donations web page. It's, it's online today, that's the link. Um, we applied for two grants now, one from the MRC, and one I thought was pretty good to the Wellcome Trust earlier this year. They didn't fund either. And so we want to keep going, we want to keep working in this space. So this is the project, essentially, if you like. Um, three centres, uh, Oxford, Poland and Spain. We work very closely with all of them. We all do different things. Poland, very good clinically. Spain, they do a lot of transcriptomics and they're very good clinically. So the setups in Spain and Poland with, with ELISA Ultra and PAL, they're really good. We don't have that clinical setup in Oxford. We, we need to get that because I want to get fresh samples to work on. It will be a four-year programme. We've got over 10 PIs across different disciplines. We need to work on other cohorts apart from ME. I think that's really important. So we've got mild stroke and lymphoma. We plan to collect over 800 samples, some longitudinal, some with various tests. So we've got clinicians that are really interested in doing that. Um, recruitment and diagnosis is, is a struggle for us, really important. Longitudinal samples was mentioned yesterday um, in various things. This, these L forms are fascinating. I'd love to do more and work out what's going on. What do they do to cells when they're inside them? And do they change transcriptomics, exosome secretion? And, and we need to validate our metabolomics cohort. We've got a very good set of samples from PAL. We have uh, heparin, EDTA plasma, serum, lots of big volumes. We can really test, does our early data with the biobank and the ME co uh, Polish cohort stack up? Um, we have some nice intervention studies. Um, we want to do long-term cryotherapy. Powell's got some interesting data there. It can slow down or Im improve symptoms in the short term. Um, I'd love to get hold of these FMT samples from Julian and, and SoftCell to look at them in a, in a research setting. We've got over, almost a million dollars already from the company in the US. They're really up for this. And they'll do all the sequencing for free on our samples. Um, we just need to get the samples. So we're looking for about 1.6 million over four to five years. We've got good collaborators in chemistry. Wade does Raman spectroscopy. Again, it's a project that's stalled. We've got some really exciting data around Raman's a diagnostic in PBMCs and exosomes. And Kim is somebody we just got involved with who's an immunologist to support this project if we can get the funding. So I will stop there. Um, I've, I've talked too long. I'm sorry about that. But I'm going to be around if you want to catch me for questions. So, thank, thank you. Very much.